What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are here to talk about the strange case of Meshuggah. If you are wondering why so, so many bands of the last 10 or 15 years sound like this, or this, or why guitars have eight strings these days, and why for a few years there, everyone was in a rush to replace their guitar amp with a modeler like an Axe FX. Well, the answer to all of those questions is simple, and it is Meshuggah. And to me, they're a very interesting case because this band is not huge by any means in terms of record sales or streaming or any of those kind of traditional metrics. But yet I would argue that they're probably like in the top three or five most influential, important metal bands of the last 20 years or so, right up there with Slipknot and Linkin Park. So how did this relatively small progressive metal band from a college town in Sweden end up changing metal forever? And what exactly was their impact? I will answer all those questions in this video. And also thank you to Helix Sleep for sponsoring this video. Like most people, sleep is super important to me. I make it a top priority to get seven or eight hours every night, no matter what. Helix Sleep makes premium mattresses and bedding that are customized to fit your needs and conveniently shipped right to your door. Everybody is different and Helix knows that. So they made a sleep quiz to match your unique body type and preferences. My wife and I took it together and based on our results, Helix matched us with their Dusk Lux mattress because I'm a side sleeper and I like more of like a medium firmness. We've had the mattress for I think about four months now and I am sincerely loving it. It is a massive upgrade from the cheap one we had before. I feel like my back is finally supported and I'm just wondering why did we not get this earlier? And with your Helix sleep mattress, you get a 100 night sleep trial along with a 10 year warranty and there are financing options and flexible payment plans. So if it makes you nervous to buy something that you haven't tried, no worries. You get more than three months to make sure that you love it. And if you don't, well, they'll pick it up from you and you will get a full refund. And the best part of all this is that Helix delivers the mattress right to your door for free within the United States. It just comes rolled up in a box and it is super easy to set up yourself. I genuinely love my Helix mattress and I think you will too. Just click on the link below in the description of this video or go to helixsleep.com slash punk rock for up to $200 off your Helix sleep mattress plus two free pillows. Meshuggah started out actually in 1987 in Umea, Sweden, which like I said, is a pretty small college town, hardly any sort of mecca for metal, and released their first demo in 1989, which if you haven't heard it, is basically like Metallica worship thrash metal. And it's certainly good, but nothing that you would necessarily want to put in the history books as far as like the best thing you've ever heard, right? And they followed that up with their first album, Contradictions Collapse in 1991, which again is more or less thrash, but I would say one step closer to the Meshuggah that we now know and love. Which brings us to the first time that I heard Meshuggah back in 1996 when a friend of mine put Future Breed Machine on a mixtape for me. Shout out to Rebecca Hodgson if by any chance you happen to be watching this because that song blew my mind. It was sort of like a combination of all the different kinds of like interesting, weird, off the wall metal happening in the 90s, but like all in one song. It had those like crunchy groove riffs of like prong or machine head, but with the weird off kilter phrasing of more progressive bands like Atheist or Pestilence, the scronky panic chord type stuff of a band like say Today is the Day. It was like super weird, but heavy as fuck at the same time. And then out of nowhere, it just like, completely changes gears and the solo comes along that sounds like something off of a Cynic album. 
It completely destroyed my brain, probably just like everyone else who heard it at the time. But aside from the relatively small number of people that I knew who paid attention to progressive metal back then, as far as I recall, they really kind of didn't get that much attention. Whatever kind of reviews or press they did get was definitely positive and musicians all loved them. But for the most part, they really kind of flew under the radar as one of these like small cult bands that was really only appreciated by the small number of people who even knew who they were. And they put out a few more albums and EPs in the 2000s, which I will talk about later, but it actually wasn't until the release of their sixth album, Obzen, in 2008, that they really kind of broke through into the larger consciousness of metal. Nothing definitely did get some traction, but Obzen was the album that really turned them into the icons that they are today, specifically because of the song Bleed, which is to this day their biggest song. And that was probably because it was included in Rock Band, which at the time was one of the biggest pop culture phenomena on the planet. If you think back to the first time you heard this song, you will know what I mean. This song basically just like melted everybody's brains with how heavy and tight and just relentlessly punishing it was, and yet still actually a really catchy song. You heard this and you're just like, how in the fuck are human beings even playing this? Are you sure that this is not some group of cyborgs sent back from the year 3000 to punish us with these riffs? Like, how is this even possible? And that feeling was only magnified when you watched a live video of it and you realize that it sounds exactly the same as the studio version. Like this band is 100% the real deal. And if you think that I am exaggerating the impact of that song, I am not. Within a few years of Bleed coming out and sort of making its way through the scene, that Meshuga style of like super tight, rhythmically dense, down-tuned chugging became really like the foundational, almost default style for new metal bands in the same way as Metallica's style of thrash riffing was kind of the standard default for bands in the 80s. And as most of you watching this video probably know, this was the origin of the term gent to describe their sound, which was originally coined by Meshuggah Shugga's guitarist Frederick, and later popularized by Misha Mansour of Periphery. I'm pretty sure Frederick from Meshuggah is the one who came up with that, and then just went around the forum, and I just said it like everyone else was saying. I just got blamed for popularizing it when it when it, I had nothing to do with it. So it's actually the onomatopoeia of that sound, right? The gen, 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 right? As opposed to... And since then, for better or worse, Gent has been by far the most influential style of metal for the past decade or so. And so with all of that being said and the history kind of stuff out of the way, let's get into some of the specifics of exactly what Meshuga contributed to modern metal and exactly how important this band is. The number one thing for me is the emphasis on rhythm to the point where it's almost like the entire band becomes a percussion instrument. Because if you think about it before the Gent era, it was really more about melody than rhythm. In the late 90s to, you know, maybe mid to late 2000s, the dominant sound in metal was that at the gates in flame style of string skipping melodic death metal riffing. Of course there were breakdowns and chugs, but what Meshuggah did for The Sound of Metal was to make it all about the chugs. Obviously there is, technically speaking, melody in their music, but really it is all about the rhythm. But what they did with those percussive, down-tuned, chuggy riffs was very different than the kind of like brain-dead, formulaic sort of way that a lot of metalcore bands approached it. I love that stuff, don't get me wrong, but let's just be real about what it was. What Meshuggah proved is that it could be way more than just a simple chug 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 kind of rhythm. They showed us the potential of these really complex, intricate rhythms in a way that totally changed the game. Specifically, they got a whole generation of musicians and listeners interested in the idea or at least the feel of polyrhythms. And to dramatically oversimplify a very complex idea, basically polyrhythms are the idea of different members of the band playing in different time signatures simultaneously that kind of drift apart and then eventually overlap, which up until Meshuggah was something primarily only found in jazz or some of the more out there kinds of progressive metal. And even if you don't necessarily know that that's what's going on, it just sounds cool because again, it's this idea of these really 
really dense, nuanced rhythms that turn chugs from this sort of like very simple caveman kind of thing into almost like a math exercise. And what's really interesting and very different from the way a lot of other progressive metal bands approached it is if you ask the guys in Meshuggah, they will tell you that they don't even play polyrhythms or weird time signatures. Here's what their drummer Thomas says about it. Someone asked, what are some of the things that people haven't been getting right? And his answer is people stating like this track starts in 2316 or whatever. Our songs are actually written on a 4-4 platform. Even though you could analyze it and make it into something else, that still doesn't make it right. Now, people debate this like they've literally written academic papers about the rhythmic structure of Meshuggah songs or whatever, but it kind of doesn't really matter. Like whether you think he is right or wrong about their time signatures, the fact that he clearly doesn't give a shit about the theory or whatever, I think is actually really important because a very important part of what makes their music work the way that it does is that even though they are obviously a very technical band, they have never chased technicality for its own sake. They just wrote the music that they wanted to hear, which happened to be in whatever time signature it's in. As opposed to a lot of other progressive metal bands who I think put technicality first and the song second. Like they go, oh, uh, we have to write a song using polyrhythms and it's in 916 and they sort of shoehorn it into that rather than taking the Meshuggah approach. And I think their music suffers for it. And I think that's a big part of why a lot of progressive metal is not very interesting to listen to because they put these sort of arbitrary technical constraints ahead of the song. And again, it doesn't really matter. Like I don't know enough theory to have really a qualified point of view on what time signature their songs are in or aren't, but it doesn't really matter because the point is that what they contributed to metal is the feel of these complex rhythm patterns in metal. And honestly, it's never been the same since. And a big part of that is the work of their drummer, Thomas. First of all, just like how insanely tight everything he plays is and how that just completely raised the bar for really everybody in metal. Like there is no way that you can hear his playing and not feel like a total scrub who should go practice 10 hours a day because he was just that much better than pretty much everybody. But in particular, the one thing that I think he really contributed to metal that has redefined everything is how he plays the kick drum in sync with the chugs on the guitars. Now, I'm not saying that was never done before. Obviously, that's been part of metal forever. Pantera did a lot there as well, but he really took it to another level. To play the kick drum like that pretty much all the time, the way that they do, was pretty new and groundbreaking. And it's a huge part of what makes the modern metal sound what it is. For example, if you listen to the isolated guitar tracks for Bleed, it definitely sounds good, right? That's a great guitar tone, super heavy. But then listen to the whole song and think about how much of the attack and body of those chugs is actually coming from the bass guitar and especially from the kick. And as metal became even more about breakdowns and chugs, in the 2000s and 2010s, that style of really tight syncopated kick drum became a huge part of the sound to the point where now pretty much everybody does it. That's just the default now, but it's not just their playing. They've also been hugely influential on the way that people produce metal from like a gear and workflow perspective. For one, a lot of people don't realize this and it's kind of ironic because they obviously have one of the best metal drummers of all time, but they actually played a huge role in popularizing the use of programmed drums in metal. And this actually started out way back in 1999 when they recorded one of the first drum sample libraries called Drum Kit from Hell, which was distributed on a CD-ROM back then. It's like very old school stuff, very pioneering. That library was played by Thomas and recorded by Daniel Bergstrand, who also recorded Destroy, Erase, Improve and put out by a company called Toontrack, also from Sweden. And the work that all those guys did with Drum Kit from Hell eventually turned into Superior Superior Drummer and then Easy Drummer, which are these incredibly popular drum programming plugins used on thousands and thousands of albums in all kinds of genres from pop to country to anything in between. And all of that started with Meshuggah, even though probably 99% of the people using Easy Drummer have no idea who that band even is. That is how significant their influence is in sort of a roundabout way. And this actually includes Meshuggah's own music. What a lot of people don't know is that the drums on on their 2005 album Catch 33 are actually fully programmed, although most people probably wouldn't know it from listening to it.
And with that album, they kind of created the blueprint for how people produce metal these days. Because if you listen to how they recorded it almost 20 years ago now, what they did is really the blueprint for how most bands operate now. We had the guitar plugged through a Line 6 straight through to a PC digitally, and as soon as someone would come up with an idea for a riff, we would record that riff immediately, all four guitars and the bass. And they just kind of wrote the drum parts as they went, just like how a lot of metal bands do now, initially with the intent of re-recording the drums, but then they were like, you know what? Actually, this sounds pretty good. Let's just leave it. And they've also played a huge, huge role in transforming metal guitar tone in general, probably more than any band since maybe like Pantera, because I think every metal guitarist who heard Meshuga instantly said, all right, whatever it takes to sound like that, I'll do it. For one, Meshuggah is a huge part of the popularity of eight and nine string guitars, starting with their 2002 album, Nothing, which was re-recorded with eight strings because the tunings that they used on seven string guitars were so low that it made the strings loose and the guitars would go out of tune. And so they had to get these custom eight string guitars made that would hold those super low tunings. So they'd been doing it for a while, but with Obzen in 2008, that is when they really exploded onto the scene for most people. And like every guitar, heard that song and was like, holy fuck, how do I get that sound? This is the most amazing, crushing, like percussive thing I have ever heard. And when they found out it was recorded with eight string guitars, everybody wanted one and here we are today. And the same is true for amp modelers like the Line 6 Pod and the Axe FX. And for those of you who aren't familiar with those products, basically you can think of them as like a little computer in a box that essentially simulates various different types of guitar amps. And these amp modelers have actually been around since like the late 80s, early 90s. And you also have to give a lot of credit to Dino from Fear Factory for being one of the early adopters. But with Meshuga really being like the default gods of metal guitar tone, I would say nobody has made a bigger impact than they have in terms of driving the popularity of modelers, especially since so many guitar boomers scoffed at modelers for so long and said, real guitarists don't use modelers and would always just go on about how modelers don't sound as good as a tube amp, which to be fair is somewhat true. They don't sound quite as good as a tube amp, although these days they're getting pretty goddamn good, but it was definitely more true in the 2000s when the gap between the two is bigger. But still, when you heard the insane monster, just like crushingly brutal tones that Meshuga was able to get out of products like the Line 6 Veta, which is a head that these days you can get for like 400 bucks used, that pretty much destroyed any of the elitists arguments about amp modelers and what they were capable of. And the same was true of the Axe Effects years later, or more recently, amp sim plugins like the Fortin Nameless, which is designed after an amp that Fortin made specifically for Meshuga. Basically, like the last 10 or 15 years of metal guitar gear has been one endless quest for metal guitarists in general to chase Meshuga's guitar tone. Although I have to say, as a lot of people probably found out after dropping 2,500 bucks on an Axe Effects after they heard that's what Meshuga used, the secret to Meshuga's tone is not their gear. The secret is actually very, very simple. It's the fact that they are insanely good players who have just put in the countless hours of practice that it takes to be that tight. Yes, obviously gear makes somewhat of a difference, but honestly, it's not much. As proof of that, go back and listen to their 1989 demo when they were playing six string guitars through Marshalls or whatever gear they had at the time. And although the recording obviously isn't the best, you can hear that the tone they were getting back then was really not that much different from what it would be 10 years later. So for all you guitarists out there, if you want to go buy their gear, by all means, go for it, have at it. But if you really want to sound like Meshuga, the answer is practice. In any case, I could keep going on forever, but what I think it comes down to is this. Although they've never really been the biggest band in the commercial sense, I think the most that they ever sold of an album was like 100,000 copies, which is certainly respectable, don't get me wrong, but compared to bands that I mentioned like Slipknot and Linkin Park, obviously that is a fraction of what those bands sold. And yet still their influence is absolutely massive to the point where pop punk artists or bands like Falling in Reverse even have Meshuga parts now. Yeah. <laughs> 
And other bands who are hugely influential in their own right, like Deftones, for example, or Tool, also cite Meshuga, and you can certainly hear that influence on some of the newer Deftones stuff, for example. And obviously there's the entire genre of Gent, which is basically hundreds and hundreds of bands from all over the world who more or less try to duplicate the magic that Meshuggah got on albums like Obzen and Destroy Erase Improve. And if you're interested in that stuff and you haven't checked it out, I would suggest some of the OG bands in the Gent genre like Sixth, Tesseract, Monuments, and of course, Periphery. Personally, as far as Gent goes, I do think very highly of the bands that I just mentioned, who are sort of the pioneers of that scene. The pioneers of ripping off Meshuga, I guess, or whatever that counts for. Although I do think all those bands added something new to the formula. Overall, I think very, very few Gent bands come anywhere close to duplicating what Meshuga did. And if I was in their shoes, meaning Meshuga's shoes, I would probably be pretty annoyed at how many times my band has just been shamelessly copied over the past 20 years. But contrary Contrary to popular belief, that is actually not the way the band feels at all, as their guitarist Martin Hagstrom explains. We really love the fact that people cite us as inspiration. I know I've gotten the question, you guys hate the gent movement and you guys hate this and that. It's like, no dude, that's not true at all. So just to kind of set the record straight there, but regardless of your personal feelings on the genre or the band, one thing that we can probably all agree on is Meshuggah's insanely huge influence on metal a legacy that will probably be felt for many, many years to come. All right, my friends, that does it for this video on Meshuggah. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. Also, check me out on Twitch, and I want to thank my patrons, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get my podcasts early, I do Q&As, I do giveaways, and if you want me to review your music live on Twitch, there is a way for you to do that as well. All you got to do is join at the $10 and up level every month. I do a call for submissions. If you want me to review something, just drop it in the comments of that post. Then I will review it live on Twitch and post it on Patreon for everyone to see. So if that sounds cool to you, hit the link in the description of this video. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.